From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Oh, hi, Pat. What's on your mind? At the moment, you. Huh? Johnny, you've been working too hard. Oh, this I've been convinced of for years, Pat, but I've never been able to convince anybody else, especially you. Okay, I'm convinced. What you need is a nice vacation, all expenses paid. Whoa, whoa. Now, Southern California is very nice this time of I year. just came back from there. The beaches, the swimming, sun, golf, nightlife. Look, life. Pat, thanks a lot, but no thanks. Well, now, John. The last time you invited me to take one of your vacations, I got hit over the head, almost run down by a truck, and kicked around by a yeah. guy seven feet tall. Yeah, but this one's different. Johnny, it's a real simple job. Oh, they all are, according to you. All I want you to do is pick up something out on the coast and bring it back here. That's all. Yeah, what? A hundred thousand dollars. Oh. Oh. I'll be right over. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Johnson payroll matter. Expense account item one, $1.25 cab fare from my apartment at the office of Universal Adjustment Bureau in Pat McCracken. thousand bucks made you prick up your ears, Johnny. <laughs> Sit down. Okay, Pat. What's the deal? You hear about the Johnson payroll robbery last week down in New York? I read about it, but there weren't too many details. They got a hundred thousand, and the payroll was insured by one of the companies we represent. How many in on the robbery, do you know? Oh, uh, we're not sure. There were several. One of them was fatally wounded. Was he able to talk before he died? Yeah, just enough to tell us the plan was to split up after the robbery, meet in another city to divvy up the loot. Uh-huh. And you think it's out in California now? We also think one of the crooks may be trying to double-cross the others. Hiding out from them, maybe? That's the general idea. We got a call from Los Angeles this morning. The fellow wouldn't give his name. But he claimed he could give us a lead on the one who has the dough. For a price, of course. Oh. So you're to meet him in L.A. and find out what he knows, if anything. What do you figure his angle is, Pat? Well, maybe several, Johnny, but I don't care. What I do care about is getting the money back. All right. How do I contact this man in Los Angeles? You don't. He'll contact you. At your hotel, the Nestor. The Nestor. Okay, Pat, I'm on my way. Oh, just one thing, Johnny. Yeah? Maybe it's occurred to you, maybe it hasn't. There will be others looking for that money, too. The other guys involved in the robbery? Yeah. Of course, if you can get there first... I'll try. Oh, and don't bother telling me to be sure to get back here in one piece. Hmm? That I'll really try to do. Expense account item two, $187 even, air transportation and incidentals to Los Angeles. I've been told to stay at the Hotel Nestor, so I took a cab. That's item three, five fifty from the airport. It was just getting dark as my cab pulled up in front of the place. Before I could get out, somebody got in. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know this cab was occupied. Well, that's okay. Welcome aboard. Here, I'll get out. And... Oh. Oh. oh, it's okay. I've got you. <laughs> Sorry, I lost my balance. Must have got my heel. Uh, you may be sorry, but I'm not. I can't think of a better way to arrive in a strange city than with a beautiful girl in your arms. If you let go of me. Oh. Oh, yeah. Well, if you insist. Oh, thanks. I'm sorry. Oh, wait a minute. You can have this gear as soon as I get my stuff out. Oh, that's all right. I'm in a hurry. I'll get another one. Goodbye. Oh, wait a second. I mean, after all... Oh, well... Yeah, that's the story of my life. The best ones always seem to get away. I went into the hotel lobby to register, but found a message waiting for me from the informant who'd phoned to Pat. I was to drive to the little town of Corrado Beach down the coast and meet a man there first thing in the morning. There was a map showing me the way to a small pier where the meeting was to take place. Hmm. Looked like Los Angeles had suddenly got too hot for him. Expense account item four, $50 to rent a car. I left word where I'd be, drove to Corrado Beach, and checked in at a motel. 
Then early next morning, I went out to the little pier. It was a ramshackle affair with a couple of beat-up boats tied to it and an old character fumbling with the door of a little bait shack. I went over to him. Hi. Good morning. Having trouble? Yeah, some kid's been monkeying with this lock. You want some bait? No, no. This is one trip I didn't come to fish. How is it, by the way? Fishing? Yeah, fine. Oh, just my luck. No, I'm supposed to meet somebody here. Oh, it must be that fellow out there. He was already there when I got here. Oh, where? Well, you see that boat, the bottom side up on the pier near the end? You mean the man sitting beside it? Yeah. Got himself a fishing rod, looks like. Could be he wants some bait. I'll, uh, I'll walk out with you and see if you don't mind. No, not at all. So the fishing's been good, huh? What have they been catching? Oh, quite a few bass last couple of days. Off the pier? Yeah. There's some kelp beds in close. Brings men around here. Funny. Hmm? Your friend there, you don't see him. Hey, sleep, I guess. Hey, watch out, he's slipping. Grab him. You got him. But, hmm. Hey, mister. Mister, he, he isn't sleeping. That's right. He's dead. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Georgia's state flag displays the state seal on a strip of blue. The seal symbolizes the fact that constitutional government rests equally on the three major branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial, and that all three must be guarded equally if a sound government is to be maintained. The greater portion of Georgia's flag is crimson. On it is superimposed the Blue Cross of St. Andrew, bearing 13 white stars for the original 13 colonies. This cross, made in the form of saltier or X, was adopted from the national flag of Scotland. Georgia's state flag, the flag of the fourth state to enter the Union, was adopted in 1956. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Johnson Payroll Matter. I'd flown 3,000 miles to meet a man, only to find him dead at the end of a rickety little pier at Corrado Beach, a knife between his ribs. I searched him while the old fellow at the bait shack went to call the police. But I didn't find a thing on him to help me. No identification, even. Later, talking to the police... Well, they didn't have any line on him either. My only lead on the payroll robbery was dead. I waited around the motel most of the day, hoping the police could turn up something on the dead man, but it was no soap. Item five, two dollars for drinks in the town's only bar while I tried to figure out my next move. And my next move was to the phone booth in the corner to call Pat McCracken back in Hartford. Collect. Oh, tough luck, Johnny. But are you sure the dead man is our informant? There was no identification on him, but he was right where he told me he'd be in the message he left for me in L.A. Uh, probably not much doubt about it, then. Oh, incidentally, I sent some mug shots out to you. Some men yeah. might have been involved in the Johnson payroll job. Send them airmail special. Yeah, I got them about an hour ago. We're not sure if any of them are the ones or not, and we don't have any line at all on the leader of the gang. Well, what's your next move, John? Uh, search me. Right now, I'm right in the middle of nowhere. I guess I... Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Maybe I'm not out of leads after all. What do you mean? Pat, I'll call you later. What pulled me off that phone in a hurry was a glimpse of somebody over near one end of the bar. I slid out of the booth and went over. Well, hi. What? Imagine meeting you here. I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. You're the girl who got into my cab in Los Angeles. I I'm afraid you're confusing me with somebody else. I'm sorry. No, I have no, to go. No, no, just a minute. I'm beginning to think it wasn't just coincidence you got into my cab. Maybe we'd better have a little talk. Please, go of my arm. You've made a mistake, and there's nothing to talk about. Is he annoying you, lady? Now, look, bartender, I'm just trying yes, to find... Yes, he is annoying me. Take your hands off her, buddy. Now, look, Joe. I mean it, and my name ain't Joe. I got you outweighed by about 40 pounds, buddy. You don't understand. Just let go of her, and we'll talk it over. I... Okay, okay. Thank you. Now... Just what is it I don't understand, buddy? 
Skip it, buddy. So she got away from me. I grabbed my top coat off a hook and stepped outside the bar. It was damp and foggy out there. I put on the coat and started looking around for her, but it was too late. She was just plain gone. Then, walking along with my hands in my coat pockets, I realized there was something in one. A key to a motel room, but not mine. Funny. Then I remembered I'd had the coat beside me in the taxi when the girl climbed in back in Los Angeles. Yeah, she could have slipped it in the coat pocket then. But why? Well, that's what I wanted to find out. I looked up the motel. It was about a mile down the highway from mine, room seven. Yeah, the key fit all right. Then as I opened the door, I realized I had company right behind me. Freeze, Dollar. Huh? Who are you? Never mind. Inside. Move. Okay. Get that blind down. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Your face looks familiar. Yeah, those mug shots McCracken sent me. You must be... Slattery. Right boy. One of the guys they suspect of pulling the Johnson payroll job. Too bright for your own good, Dollar. You must be the one who killed the man out on the pier. The man who was going to tell me where the payroll door is. That's a nice stall, Dollar, but it won't work. What do you mean, Slattery? Blake killed him and you know it. Yeah? Who is Blake? You want to play it coy, huh, Dollar? Okay, we'll do it your way. Blake's got the payroll door and you're working with him. Just how do you figure that? Blake's girlfriend climbed in your taxi in Los Angeles. I figure she slipped you the key to this room. Hey, look, you got a few things all twisted. Shut up and stand still. This gun has a habit of going off sometimes. No kidding. So where's the dough? Take it or leave it, Slattery. I don't know. Well, it better be in this room. Yeah? And if it isn't? You guess. I don't think I need more than one. If it isn't here, I'm not leaving. Is that the idea? Oh, you leave, all right. It's just that you won't be walking out of here. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Over 150 years ago, the Swiss poet Henri Amiel wrote, Heroism is the brilliant triumph of the soul over fear. Heroism is the dazzling and glorious concentration of courage. During the Korean campaign... Corporal Ronald Rosser was attached to the heavy mortar company of the 38th Infantry, 2nd Division, United States Army. Rosser, a veteran of World War II, rejoined the army and shipped to Korea when he heard that his brother had fallen in the winter assault of the Chinese communists. One day, Rosser's company moved into enemy territory. At the time, the corporal was a forward observer and carried a radio. Suddenly, in the midst of an enemy attack, Rosser handed his radio to a buddy, slipped the safety off his carbine, and filled his shirt with hand grenades. He charged at the enemy through fierce mortar and artillery fire, shooting from the hip. Straddling a bunker, he riddled its occupants. Still advancing, he accounted for two more of the enemy, shooting one through the head and clubbing another to death. Continuing his one-man charge, he jumped into a trench full of enemy soldiers, opened fire, and forced his way relentlessly down the length of the trench killing right and left with grenades and carbine fire. Out of ammunition, he returned to his company, where he replenished his supply. Then he charged the enemy again and again. Finally, he returned to his own area, and taking the radio back from his friend, he moved out with his company. Corporal Ronald Rosser was awarded the Medal of Honor for his action, action which had shown the enemy that his personal code of conduct wouldn't let them push around either his kid brother or his country. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Johnson Payroll Matter. Look, Slattery, you've torn this motel room completely apart. Obviously, that payroll money isn't here. That's right, Deller. So now you're going to tell me where it is. Oh, brother, you take a lot of convincing. I told you I don't know. 
So why don't you put that gun away and listen? You're the one who takes the convincing dollars, so I start convincing. Oh, That's not going to do you any good. No? Well, for sure it's not going to do you any good, so... Now, wait a minute. Look. Look, I'll give you the whole story. And I'm supposed to believe it, huh? Staring down that gun barrel, I'm not about to lie. Let's have it. All right. A guy called us from Los Angeles, said he could give us a lead on who had the dough from the Johnson payroll job. It was Hollis. He was hoping you'd lead him to it. Hollis? Yeah, yeah, the guy you found out in the pier dead. And you said a man named Blake killed him. You know Blake killed him. You know Blake engineered the holdup and then ran out on Hollis and me. Do I? Sure, because you're in with him. I seen his girl get in your cab in Los Angeles. Okay, so she got in my cab, but I didn't know her. I'd never seen her before. She slipped you the key to this motel room, didn't she? Yeah, now I think I know why. She was trying to sidetrack us. Lead us to think the dough was here so it would take the pressure off Blake and her. That part of your story I don't buy, Dollar. I think you know where that dough is and I want it. Now look. Talk! If you think I'm going to take any more of this. This gun says that's exactly what you're going to do until you decide to talk. I roll with this next one and let my eyes droop when my knees sag. He reached out to steady me, and I gave my left foot in the stomach to flatten it. By the time he got to his feet, I was out the door. I dove behind some bushes down the road, and I waited. He pounded right on past me, gun in hand. I waited until he was out of sight, then doubled back to my car. Apparently, Slattery didn't know Blake's girl was around here somewhere. One thing was sure, I had to find her, but fast. There were only three motels in town. The one I was staying at, the one where Slattery had been playing patty cake on my jaw, and a third off the highway near the beach. I drove to that one and checked the register. It showed a minor grant in number eight. Oh! Hello, Minor. No, please, get out. Oh, no, sorry. We're going to have that talk right now. I tell you, you've made a mistake about me. Oh, come on. Drop the act, Minor. I know you're Blake's girlfriend, that you slipped that motel key in my coat pocket in L.A. to get me off the trail of the Johnson payroll money. The, the what? I also know that Blake masterminded the robbery and double-crossed his buddy, held out on him. Oh, I... I guess I knew it must be something like that. Well, what are you talking about? Mr. Dollar, I... I haven't known Fred Blake very long. A month, maybe. I didn't know what he did for a living, and I didn't ask him. Two days ago, he said he was in trouble and needed my help. He wanted me to slip that key into your coat pocket in the taxi in Los Angeles. To take Slattery off his trail. Then he told me to meet him here at the beach. When I saw you in the bar a while ago, I got panicky. I didn't know what to do. But that's all I know about it. Mr. Dollar, I didn't know Blake was a criminal. Honestly, I didn't. Yeah? Then will you help me find him? Yes. I will, Mr. Dollar. If I can. The trouble is, right now, I don't know where he is any more than you do. Well, it be, folks. Hey, wait a minute, buddy. Ain't you the one that was molesting this young lady an hour ago? Oh, Tarzan, buddy, my molesting days are over. Oh, it's all right, bartender. I'm sorry I caused you the trouble. No trouble, ma'am. Just glad it turned out all right. Things, uh... Happened fast here at the beach, I guess. I don't suppose you've ever heard of a guy named Fred Blake, have you? Yeah, not that I remember. You looking for him? Yeah. What's he look like? Well, medium height, uh, dark hair, and brown eyes, and yeah. regular features. Yeah, that description would fit half the guys that come in here. Sure. Fishermen, salesmen, vacation. No, only that kind don't come in here anymore. Salesmen? No, fishermen. I thought the fishing was good here. Been no fishing around here for months. Huh? A fellow told me they were getting a lot of bass right off the pier. <laughs> it was pulling your leg, buddy. There's a chemical plant nearby. A lot of stuff got dumped into the water by accident a few months ago. The fish haven't been back since. Wait a minute. Sure, right under my nose all the time. What do you mean, Johnny? Martin, I'll see you later. I got in my car and headed for the pier. As I turned off the highway, I could see a car a couple of hundred yards back following me with its lights off. But I couldn't stop now. I parked near the pier and headed for the bait shack. The windows were still boarded over, but I could see a crack of light between the boards. I eased over to the shack. Oh, no. I flattened against the wall as the door came open and Blake came out with a gun. I hacked it out of his hand. What? All right, hold it, hold it, Blake. 
Well, the fisherman's friend, huh? Look, you... you killed that guy on the end of the pier just before I showed up this morning. You didn't have time to leave, so you're covered by making like you worked here. Then it occurred to you this was a pretty good hideout until Slattery got off your trail. Look, look, maybe we can make a deal, Dollar. Oh, we're going to. You turn the stolen money over to me, and I turn you over to the police. Drop your gun, Dollar. Huh? Drop it. Okay, Slattery. <laughs> Hello, Blake. Glad to see me. Look, Slattery, I, I wasn't trying to cross you. I, I was going to get in touch with you when things quieted down. <laughs> sure you were. Let's have the dough. Uh, all right, it, it's in the shack. Blake half turned, and I saw his hand slide into his coat, a second gun. He whipped it out, but Slattery had seen it, too. Uh, he got Blake, but his eyes were off me for a lucky second. I checked Blake. He was still alive. Yeah, they'd both keep for a long time. Item six, $174 even, air transportation and incidentals back home. Expense account total, $526.50. Remarks, the payroll money is back where it belongs. And Slattery and Blake are back where they belong, with Blake facing a murder rap to boot. Funny, I probably wouldn't have nailed him if he hadn't told me that phony story about the fish biting near the pier. Teaches me a lesson, Pat. I'm not going to tell any more fish stories. They can kill you. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Ohio's state flag is the only pennant-shaped flag, or burgee, as it is correctly called. The Buckeye banner is the creation of an engineer who created a blue triangle for the hills and valleys, red and white stripes for the roads and waterways of the state. There are 13 stars for the original 13 colonies and four extra stars to indicate that Ohio was the 17th state admitted to the Union. A white circle with a red center represents the initial letter of Ohio and suggests its nickname, the Buckeye State. Ohio's state flag, the flag of the 17th state to enter the Union, was adopted on May 9, 1902. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a pair of common, ordinary glasses solve a case for us. The gruesome spectacle matter. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Today's story was written by Robert Stanley. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Forrest Lewis, Shepard Menken, and Frank Gerstle. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.